Happy Sabbath. And it's a privilege to be here and to stand before you this morning to share a message. One last warning. For those who were here last night, I mentioned the last gospel sign that Jesus told us would appear before the end would come. And for those who were here last night, what was that last gospel sign that we're looking for? It is the spread of the gospel. He says, this gospel, Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This morning, this prophecy seminar of last night and today is a little bit of a difference because I'm coming uh, uh, at you from the perspective of missionary work. Ever since the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the people understood that they were a movement of prophecy. And here we are today as reformers. We too understand we are a movement of prophecy. And uh, I was talking to someone uh, during the week, or just met, I was emailing someone during the week, and uh, we are just discussing about um, our, our name and what have you, and they said the reform's okay, but I'm not sure about movement, <laughs> because... I don't know if that still fits. There doesn't seem to be much movement happening. Well, I hope after this morning and, and today that we'll generate some movement when it comes to preaching this gospel. To where? Where's the gospel got to go? To all nations, right? To all nations. This was Now, Jesus spoke this uh, in, uh, to his disciples, giving them signs of his coming. That's when, the, of all the signs he gave, the whole list of them, he says, and then shall the end come when? When the gospel has preached to all the world for witness. So to me, no matter what you're looking for, no matter what you're expecting to happen, and all the events that we can think of, there's only one thing that's going to happen that's going to mark the end. According to Jesus, the gospel preached to all the world. Then the end comes. And it so happens that John, some 70 years later, was given a revelation <coughs> of when, in prophetic uh, vision, of when this movement would take place, of this gospel going to all the world just prior to Jesus' coming. And we find that in Revelation chapter 14. In particular, I shared last night, beginning with verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. To every who? What's it say there? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Yeah? That is the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Jesus said it would happen. John was shown in vision it happening. And guess what? We are living in the very time when it is to happen. This gospel will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This angel of Revelation, sorry, of Revelation 14, this first angel, commenced his work. We understand from prophecy and the prophecies of Daniel, we understand this angel commenced his work when? What year was this angel going forth or commencing his work to go forth? in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Well, we know in verse 7, it tells us the context. It says, fear God. This is the message he gives. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Yeah? And worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So this angel preaching the everlasting gospel to all the world for a witness it's preached in the time of God's judgment when it is come not when it will come or it has come but it is come the hour of judgment is come it's a present judgment hour message it's a call to fear God to give him glory and to worship him as what? As who? Who do we worship God as? According to that passage in Revelation 14, verse 7, worshipping Him as the Creator. 
As the Creator, yes. So it's a call to worship, and that's what the Gospel's always been about, a call to worship God, to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Saviour, to give our life to Him in loving service. That's what the Gospel's been all about, to accept the forgiveness of our sins, to accept the new heart that He promises to give us, to be filled with all His fullness, the fullness of divine love, to let Jesus' love fill your heart and life, that your life becomes, or uh, His life becomes your life. And as the world looks at you, they see Jesus in you. That's the gospel message, the witness to the world. That's the message that is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. There's so much I could talk about that this morning. I don't want to specifically. I don't have time to. But that's in in essence what it is. It's practical godliness. When it comes to fearing God and giving Him glory, as Revelation 14 verse 7 says, Jesus said in Matthew that as a church we are to let our light shine before men that they might see what? Your what? Your good works. Are they seeing your good works? And for order for what? He said they might see your good works and glorify who? God, your Father in heaven. So when you look at the gospel message, it's all tied up with the glory of God being revealed in a good works and people seeing the good works in us, glorifying the Father because of those good works. That's what Jesus did. He came to bless all of humanity. He lived a life of consecration to his Father in heaven, lived a life of obedience, lived a life of good works, blessing not himself, but blessing others. I lived a life of service and so he calls us to the same work. He died for us, the Apostle Paul told us, he died for us that we might not live for ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, we might not live for ourselves, but unto him which died for us and rose again. You know, this is, oh, there's so much wrapped up in this, but this this wonderful message of the gospel is going to be proclaimed to all the world for a witness. Not that all the world will respond to it, not that all the world will receive it, but it will go to every person, that every person may have opportunity to receive the love of Jesus, to hear the love of God and receive Jesus as their personal saviour. That's the message that's to go. But you know what? It's quite interesting if you turn your Bibles with me to Revelation 14, because while this gospel is going forth, the prophecy reveals something that has been manifest ever since Adam and Eve fell. And that is an antagonism towards the gospel that leads to conflict. It leads to conflict. We're never able to preach the gospel without pushback against it. And so we see here in this this, uh, prophecy of the movement going forth in these last days, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, we see in connection with it two other messages. We see two other angels revealed here. Revelation 14, verse 8, one angel is, is, a second angel joins that first angel, proclaiming, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then in connection with that is a third angel, Revelation 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image, or receive his mark in his forehand or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So on and so forth. So there's, while there's a wonderful message, the everlasting gospel being proclaimed to all the world for a witness, the love of Jesus seen in the life of his people, in their good works, at the same time, there's connected with it a warning. One aspect is to, is to come out of Babylon. The second aspect is to not receive the mark of the beast, nor to worship the beast. Uh, this is a warning that God has, has get, told us will be proclaimed together with the gospel. So, now, many Christians 
read these verses, particularly regarding the mark of the beast, and come to certain conclusions on them. I was listening to, uh, uh, on YouTube to uh, a couple of Christians discuss this topic, and um, I thought, wow, they are so far off when it comes to the mark of the beast. Who's heard the mark of the beast is a microchip that's going to be put under your skin, in your hand? Who's heard that? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, we heard about the microchip, right? Before the microchip, we heard there was a, there was a big computer system you know, somewhere in Europe there that's called the beast and it's, and it's collating all the data, dossiers on us all, yes? And every, every person in the world will be given a number. You know, you all have a number. America, it's a social security number maybe. Here, it might be your tax file number. Who knows? But we'll all be given a number. And the beast will have its number as well. And so you've heard that, yeah? The computer system. Who's heard about a computer system? Yeah? Well, you know, what's interesting here is that in Revelation 13, it tells us this mark of the beast can be received in the hand, but where else can it be received? In the forehead. Okay? What we don't appreciate is that the mark, while it may be connected with your financial transactions per se, it might be connected with um, your respect of government laws and, and so on and so forth, yet what a lot of people miss, uh, miss the point on here is that this mark is a connection or is a connected vitally with worship. Remember the first angel's message is a call to worship God and fear Him. And in opposition, you've got the mark, a warning against receiving the mark. Now I want to share with you this, uh, very quickly seven facts about this mark of the beast. And some of this we'll know already. And I just want to bring it out to you clearly that we can appreciate in time in which we're living right now. So I want to quickly go through seven facts concerning the mark of the beast. As I said, the fact number one, the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. If any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. It's a question of worship here. And whoever would not worship the beast, you know, was, would, were assigned to, to be killed. So this is a, a, a vital question. It's the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. Uh, so God's people will not worship the beast or receive his mark. Fact number two tells us that there will be a people who worship the beast and his image and receive the name, his mark, of, the mark of his name, as opposed to those, in verse 12, who keep his commandments, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So verse 11 is, is connecting the worship of the beast and receiving his mark as opposed to those who are keeping God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. So fact number two, if I could just summarise, is this, that uh, God's people will worship Him, they keep His commandments, they have the faith of Jesus, and according to Revelation 14 verse 1, the very first verse of the chapter, they have their Father's name in their foreheads. Okay, so it's a worshipping of God, keeping His commandments, having the faith of Jesus, in, in contrast to worshipping the beast and His image. If we worship, the point is that if we worship God, keep His commandments, and have the, face of Jesus, have the faith of Jesus, we will not worship the beast or be deceived into receiving His mark. That's the, that's the point here. In regard to fact number three, only one commandment talks about worshipping God as our Creator. And I mentioned this last night. Which commandment is that? The fourth commandment. It's the only commandment of all ten of God's commandments that have anything to do with worship, specifically. What day is given there to worship Him on? The seventh day. 
So we can see here that, that this is bringing to mind that the seventh day Sabbath has something to do with the worship of God and it's going to be involved in this last conflict. The seventh day, in Exodus 20, verses 10 and 11, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Very similar phraseology there to Revelation 14, verse 7. To worship God as the creator. Him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that, it, that is in them. So the Sabbath is vitally connected. As I mentioned last night, just as this message was being proclaimed about the Sabbath truth in 1844 onwards, in the context of the everlasting gospel, we had a counterfeit movement that's very much uh, prevalent today. The movement of, ev of uh, scientific uh, belief in evolution as being the means of, of God or the means of us coming into existence and evolving into the beings we are today, as opposed to the facts of Scripture that point to God as the Creator. In six days, literal six literal days, He made everything, including you and me and our first parents, Adam and Eve. So these are the facts, number three, that the, that the seventh day, is going to be a, a point that's going to be vitally connected with the worship of God in, the, in this uh, last days, in the Mark of the Beast uh, issue. Fact number four. If you look at your church history, I'm not talking about of the last hundred years. I want you to go back to three, four, five hundred years. Do you know that the Protestant reformers, and even before those Protestant reformers of the 16th century, the great majority of them identified the Antichrist, the great Antichrist power of Scripture. This same uh, lecture I was, I was listening to, not lecture, but discussion between these two Christians I was listening to uh, during the week, they were talking about, you know, this last move in the Antichrist power and there's going to be this, this person set up and they're going to be the Antichrist person and um, they're going to bring in tribulation and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, they're so far off because they're looking to the future for the Antichrist. The reality is that the, our, our forefathers, our pilgrim fathers, our, heritage, our, our Christian uh, fathers of the past identified already who the Antichrist power is. I'm talking here of Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, Thomas Cranmer, Roger Williams, the Baptist Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, Reverend J.A. Wiley, all these great scholars, great students, Bible students, and the Westminster Confessions of Faith, the Baptist Confession of Faith, all identify the Antichrist of Scripture as the Roman Catholic system, the Pope, the Pope being the head of that system. And so, if, we, if we, you'll find historically, through a careful study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, these Protestants identified the papacy as the Antichrist and Rome as the apostate power of revelation that opposes God's people. When I say Rome, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic system. Okay, not the people, okay, not the people themselves, but the system and those in control of that system with the Pope as the head of that system. So the beast of revelation is a symbol of the Roman Catholic system of worship and the false authority centred in the Pope. Historically, it was identified as such and it has not changed to this day. Now, fact number five is tied in with this authority of the church. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it changed the day of Christian worship from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day. The Roman, and the Roman Catholic Church claims this as a mark of her ecclesiastical authority. Fact number six. According to Cardinal uh, the, uh, Thomas, H.F. Uh, uh, Thomas, who was the Chancellor of, the Cardinal, of Cardinal Gibbons in November the 1st, 1895, he wrote, of course, the Catholic Church claims the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. 
So for me, it's quite clear here, when we, when we identify the beast, when we are, are, are um, clear on that, who the beast of Revelation is, and what is her mark, she's already told us what her mark is, it's the mark of ecclesiastical authority, is the change of Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. It's a sign of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Understanding this, you've only got to look, and you can look at the newspapers and, and, and news reports and whatnot to verify all this, but you know, it leads me to fact number seven. Do you know right now today that the Pope Francis is pushing for Sunday laws? It has been since at least 2014. Uh, he, in, uh, keeping the stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, he declared in 2014. And then in 2015, he released an encyclical calling for action on climate change and a number of meetings he's had with, the, with world leaders, urging them to act on extreme weather. Now, what has Sunday got to do with climate change? <laughs> well, I want to go to um, an encyclical that Pope Francis um, uh, published in 2015. It's called Laudato Si. And I want to just quote a little bit from that. It's a quite lengthy uh, encyclical, but I just want to highlight one particular point that stands out for me. Notice what he says in regard to Sunday. He's connecting the Eucharistic worship on Sunday with climate, um, protecting the environment, basically, doing our bit, bit for climate change, to prevent climate change. Sunday, he says, is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created real reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. In this way, Christian spirituality incorporates the value of relax relaxation and festivity. So basically he's saying that Sunday as Jesus rose on Sunday, transfigured Jesus in his glorified human nature. Um, that's the pledge that all of the creative family will uh, join together in such a recreation, eventually. And he says that Sunday is the day that we remember that on, that fact. And also, he says, the Sunday the day that is the day of rest is centred on the Eucharist. Now, what's the Eucharist? For those who don't know, what's the Eucharist? It's the communion service. We call it a communion service, okay? It's the wafer and the wine, the partaking of it. And there, as we meet together to partake, this is what you know, the... Pope believes as we meet together to partake on that, of, of that uh, wafer, the Eucharist service. It sheds light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. To rest on Sunday is to not only be revived spiritually, but it's also to remind ourselves to care for our environment as well. The environment that our Lord has created us, uh, Lord, our creator has created for us and we should care for it. So the Pope was connecting Sunday worship directly with care for the environment and, the, and uh, all, that, all that that entails. Now in 2019, in June of 2019, the Pope Francis declared a climate emergency, urging world energy leaders to act. He said a failure to act urgently to reduce greenhouse gases would be a brutal act of injustice toward the poor and future generations. He endorsed the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit on temperature rises and said that the radical energy transition would be needed to stay within that limit and urge young people and businesses to take a leading role. Okay, so this is what the Pope is advocating here for, for the world, to, especially the young people, to take a leading role in, in, in to make, taking action against the climate change. 
At the same time, he's promoting Sunday as a wonderful day to to, uh, remind ourselves and to motivate ourselves for that care and concern for the environment. But not only that, not only that, it's not only the Pope doing this, it's not only the Pope. Um, there, is, there, was a, a, there was a Jewish um, a PhD doctor, uh, he's an economist, and, um, and he wrote an article in the CEO World magazine. This is a magazine for chief executive officers of businesses around the world. And he wrote there that uh, proposing an international day of rest of approximately 53 days per year and an additional 15 days off where both individuals and industry would refrain from all creative manufacturing and productive activity. Now, what he's saying here, why 53 days and these 15 days together? Well, 53 days is roughly one day per per week. And the 15 days, another 15 days is, guess what? That's the holidays you get the public holidays we get roughly, right? Australia here, it's about, what, 10? Some of the places, it's a few, it's a few more. Depending, and if you add the state holidays, it's roughly around 12 to 14 days a year. So putting all that together, if you were to stop work, if all of industry stops work for roughly about 70 uh, days a year, you, no factories are operating, no um, emissions are being sent to the environment, what happens? You reduce the effects of climate change by 20%. These 70 days represent approximately 20% of the year and they would help achieve the shared goal outlined in the Paris Climate Conference of a 20% reduction of pollution globally by 2050. So this is, a, this is not a, a Catholic not a Christian, he's a Jew. But he's just saying, look, this is all about climate. So you've got the Catholic Church promoting Sundays, a day of rest in connection with the climate, We're reducing our impact on the environment. We have a Jewish economist advocating, advocating the same thing and recommending that this is a day. Now, he's not saying this really has to be a Sunday, but at least these 70 days a year would be a, a, a wonderful reduction or impact upon the environment by 20% and will help get us down to the figures that they're all aiming for. He says here that this um, uh, Sabbath for ourselves, our industry and our environment is a corrective to these failures. So not only now do you have Jews, the Catholics pushing for it, Catholic Church, the Jewish economists pushing for it, but we also see and, and about... 11 years ago, there was an alliance formed in Europe. It's called the European Sunday Alliance. And that was launched in Brussels on the June 20, where Christians and European trade unions defend the Sunday rest. It was, and Catholic and Protestant institutions were involved in that alliance. And this is businesses, uh, non-government organizations and churches all banding together to promote a work-free Sunday throughout all of Europe. And that was in 2011. Now, some countries already have relative restrictions on Sunday. In fact, uh, Poland in 2017, the Polish parliament voted to return Sunday to a day of rest. In 2017. So this is happening As I speak, all of this is happening right before us. And you only have to read some of the headlines over the last uh, few years. Let's make Sunday, in Fox News, another uh, uh, opinion writer here, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. Let's make, why not make Saturday a day of rest? No, because everyone's used to Sunday being a day of rest. So let's just make Sunday a day of rest. Again, the reason given here is because it's going to be good for ourselves. It's good for our environment. It's good for uh, you know, just the family life as well. Notice this, um, the, uh, Thomas Mann, who was the uh, co-chair or is the co-chair of the European Parliament Interest Group representing the um, European Sunday Alliance uh, in an article 
Um, he wrote, we must defend workers against the philosophy of the always available employee. MEPs, which are the members of the European Parliament, and the EU should stand by side by side with us to safeguard Sunday as the day of rest, recreation, and for religious service. Okay, that's right now, that's, that's, that's what their movement is, is all about. So safeguarding Sunday is the day of rest, recreation, and religious service. Now, in the wake of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and everything that happened with that, uh, both the loss of life, but also the terrible restrictions that a lot of people suffered at the hands of various governments. And I mentioned um, this a uh, couple of weeks back, where I was speaking, uh, that uh, a report came out about the um, Australia's government's response to the pandemic. And it, and it basically concluded that while the measures were appropriate in, in many respects, there was a large degree of overreach in many other respects, an overreach of government. Borders were shut that shouldn't have been shut. Schools were closed that should never have been closed. People who were, who were put off from work that should never have been required to be put off from work. The, these things were all overreaches. You know, it says that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And mankind, mankind is prone to err on the side of judgment, right? That's what we are prone to do and to make sure that you know, everyone obeys the laws. And so, in view of all this, though, um, the Catholic Canada, which is a Catholic magazine in Canada, a website here, uh, the author there promoting bring back the blue laws. Now, what are the blue laws? Well, blue laws will, are laws that are called, they're called blue laws because they exist on the statute books of the various state governments in America. And we've got some of them still here today in, in, in other various states, okay? But these are the blue laws. And they're called blue because they're written in blue, but they're not enforced. They're not enforced. They're laws that restrict activity on Sunday. In the United States, on the seventh day of the week, trade and industry seem suspended. Throughout the nation, all noise ceases. A deep peace, or rather a sort of solemn contemplation, takes place. The soul regains its own domain and devotes itself to meditation. Now, those words were penned in 1835 by Alex... Alexis de, de Tocqueville, who wrote a masterpiece of political and social analysis called Democracy in America. So he was speaking of what it was like in America in 1835. And what's happened? Commerce took over. The almighty dollar took over. And Sunday became just a regular trading day like any other day. And so what is he calling for here? What is the, per the author of this article calling for? He's calling for bring back those blue laws. We need them. We need Sunday to be that day of rest again as it once was. Acknowledging the rewards, I'm just reading, quoting here from the article, acknowledging the rewards of the Sabbath are not limited only to Christians like Pope Francis, who in 2018 declared one day of the week, that's the least, out of gratitude to worship God, to spend time with the family, to play, to do all of these things, we are not machines. And so in, in uh, echoing that sentiment, there are business leaders and, and, and opinion writers advocating we need to return to a Sunday day of worship, of rest, recreation, and for religiously inclined, a day of worship. You see, the mark of the beast doesn't have to be received in the forehead. The forehead is where our conscience is, right? And with our conscience, we worship God. With our mind, we worship God. You don't have to receive the mark of the beast in your mind. You could receive it in your hand. You could just go along with it. Stop working on that day. You know, and you enjoy the recreation and whatever else goes along with that, time with the family. You don't necessarily have to go to church to receive the mark of the beast. You just have to respect that day. Yeah? Just respect that day. And as everyone else would be by not going to work on that day. So this is, this is the call that's, that's taking place in society today as I speak. But the Bible says 
there is going to be a final warning. It must go. A warning against receiving this mark. Why? Why? Let me share with you Great Controversy, page 449. The most fearful uh, threatening ever addressed to mortals is contained in the third angel's message. That must be a terrible sin which calls down the wrath of God unmingled with mercy. Men are not to be left in darkness concerning this important matter. The warning against this sin is to be given to the world before the visitation of God's judgments that all may know why they are to be inflicted and have opportunity to escape them. This warning must be given. Who's going to give the warning? Who's God called to give the warning? Us. Prophecy declares that the first angel would make his announcement to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The warning of the third angel, which forms a part of the same threefold message, is to be no less widespread. It is represented in the prophecy as being proclaimed with a loud voice by an angel flying in the midst of heaven, and it will command the attention of the world. You thought the pandemic was bad. You know, this is going to command the attention of the world. And what's going to happen when this, happen, when, this, when this goes forth in power, when this message goes forth, what's going to happen? How is the world going to respond? Let's have a look. Revelation 13, verse 15 tells us, it's, it's over a conflict of worship. What will happen? It says, talking about this image of the beast, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We're talking here of death. It's ironic that we're going to have two movements at play in conflict with each other. One movement is proclaiming the everlasting gospel, calling the world to fear God, give Him glory and worship Him as the Creator, but, and do not receive His mark, the mark of the beast, I should say. Do not receive the mark of the beast. For if you do receive the mark of the beast, the same person will, and you're caught worshipping the beast, the same person will receive of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out with our mixture. God's wrath awaits those who receive the mark of the beast. On the other hand, for those who don't receive the mark of the beast, what awaits them? Not just cannot buy or sell, but according to this verse here, what awaits them? Death. You've got one decree over here, the third angel's message, decreeing that do not receive or else you receive the wine of God's wrath, which results in death. Or you have this movement over here saying if you do not receive the mark, you're going to be killed. But what did Jesus say? Fear not them which are able to kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Yeah, but fear him. I would say reverence him. That can destroy both soul and body in hell. I'd say hellfire there. So we've got a choice to make. The world is going to be brought to a decision. And, you know, this decision will result in us not being able, as was mentioned by the brother here, not being able to buy or sell. And we saw what was happening in the last um, two... Oh, well, we now, was it, we're sort of out of the restrictions right now, but say not 2020, 2021 in particular, those two years. How easy was it to buy and sell in those two years? Huh? Well, you could, provided you did what? <laughs> provided you wore a mask, right? You go in the shops, provided you wore a mask. And even then, provided the shopping and selling was only within five kilometres of your home or ten kilometres or whatever it was, whatever the restriction was there. Ah. And then the vaccine, yes, and the vaccine. When it, when it came to, uh, came to uh, entering into all these other venues and going places, the vaccine was a mandatory. And I had, I had read, and I had 
people saying, oh, this is the mark of the beast, this is the mark of the beast, and a lot of Christians saying, this is the mark of the beast. Look, it's not the, that was not the mark of the beast, but it certainly was a precursor to what power can be exercised over us by the governments that rule us. If we don't comply, what, what do we face? Fines. And some people come to the point of even going to jail over that, over their re refusal to obey some of the mandates, even when it came to public worship. Okay, we don't do anything to uh, stir up authorities, but you know, I don't know, I was in conflict all through those two years, I was always in conflict. How far do you go? How far do we go? In, in recognizing our liberty to worship God versus the restriction the government's placing upon us. There's always a balancing act. But when it comes to this question, what day to worship God on? What day shall we make a day of rest? Let everyone be clear, there is no ambiguity here. The Bible is clear that the Sabbath is the seventh day. And for the world to mandate that we worship God on the, seventh of the, on the first day is a direct violation of the commandments of God. Not only that, when it, start, when it will eventually persecute those who refuse and to maintain their worship of, of the Sabbath, when persecution hits, brothers and sisters, this is our test. This will be our test. What are you going to do in that day? You know what? God's going to have a people who are standing firm for Him, who are proclaiming this message in power to all the world for a witness. They're keeping His commandments. They have the faith of Jesus. They're letting their light shine and thus glorifying their Father by their good works and not allowing themselves to be held back when it comes to proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Why is that? What is it, particularly at that time, that will prevent them from, or that, that will um, enable them to keep going despite the persecution? What is it? And then we so much need it right now. That's what the early church, Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem till you receive it. What is it? What is it that we need? The Holy Spirit. The latter rain power. Are we crying out for that? Are we praying for it? You know, uh, you are getting, uh, let me share with you from uh, Spalding and McGahn collection, page, uh, chapter, page 4, paragraph 3. You are getting the coming of the Lord too far off. I saw the latter rain was coming as suddenly as the midnight cry and with ten times the power. For those of you who know Adventist history, the midnight cry was that cry, behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him, that, went, that, that uh, took place in the summer of 1844. And that cry was the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the waiting Advent believers who were uh, confused about the timing of the first angel's message when Christ was meant to come. And they realized, no, it wasn't the, wasn't the spring of 1844, it's the autumn. And Sister White says, the Holy Spirit... Um, enlightened their minds, filled their hearts, and they went forth and said, oh, look, this was a tarrying time here, according to the, to the prophecy of the parable of the ten virgins. There was a, that all the virgins slumbered and slept. But then, um, in the parable, a time of waiting and slumber, slumber is followed by the coming of the bridegroom. And this was in accordance with the arguments just presented, both from prophecy and from the types. <laughs> They carried strong conviction of their truthfulness and the midnight cry was heralded by thousands of believers. That is the, the cry to go you out to meet him, getting ready for October 22nd, 1844. 178 years since that cry first was given, or well, that date first uh, took place there, under the first angel's message, was just what, two weeks ago, Yeah. October 22nd, 1844. 
They went forth, and it says here, like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land, from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country places it went until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Like a tidal wave. There was little ecstatic joy, but rather deep searching of heart, confession of sin and forsaking of the world. If that's what was required then, brothers and sisters, God requires the same for us today. Deep searching of heart, confession of sin, forsaking the world. A preparation to meet the Lord was the burden of agonizing spirits. There was persevering prayer and unreserved consecration to God. That's what's required for us to give this message in power. At Pentecost, the mission was given to them. Go you therefore into all the world uh, and teach all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. That was the commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. Before ascending to heaven, he gave his disciples their commission. He told them that they were to be executors of the will in which he bequeathed to the world the treasures of eternal life. The Gospel Commission is the great missionary charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to do what? Go to the people with their message. Beloved Now is the time. Now is the end. Are we prepared to give this message? Are we preparing to give it? When we call for missionary activities, won't it be so wonderful for the whole church to turn up to the missionary activity or the missionary campaign, whatever it might be? Who enjoyed the canvassing weekends? Brother uh, Jacob, who enjoyed that? Great. You know, and canvassing is just one tool. It's just one tool in the tool bag that God's given to us. This afternoon, we're going to look at a few more things that we could uh, cover off on to, be, to, be, uh, to equip ourselves to be more faithful missionaries in, in being prepared to give this message to the world. And not only that, but to, as it says here, not to wait for the people to come to them, but to go to the people. You know, we had a wonderful... Um, uh, Three weeks, for the first time in two years, uh, Schofield's Church put on their cooking demonstrations. We've been doing that for 20 years up there. And for the first time in, in two years, we put them on at the beginning of uh, October. October the, uh, the 10th, the 17th and the 24th. And so that first meeting, we had about 11 visitors. The next one, we had about 20. The last one, we had about 40, you know. And as a result of that, in fact, we had some person came to our first meeting because we had the banner outside and the banner was just, we put it out there advertising the cooking demonstrations and her husband happened to be driving past the church, saw the banner and got home and said, hey, listen, you need to go to this, this, this church down the road there. It's, they're having the cook, a vegetarian cooking demonstration. It so happened that his wife had just become a vegetarian, a vegan vegetarian a week before and uh, you know, was, needed some help on just what can I cook? Anyway, she came along and um, she loved it. She loved it. And so, so it was really, really thrilling. Not only that, we had another person call us up uh, this week. Lydia was just telling me that, to say that, look, I just want to ask permission to use your recipes. I'm going to put on a, veg a vegan cooking demonstrations in our home and I have about 20 people coming. I just want to get permission for Elam Health to put these on it um, and use the, use, the demonstra use the recipes, actually, in the home. And Lydia said, oh, of course, sure, just, as long as you just give us the credit, that's fine. Like, just give <laughs> and so she said she will. She will, she'll do that. But I, it's just amazing what happens. You know, and if you're just are consistently doing something... In fact, I was just before the cooking demonstrations, um, I was reviewing the websites. I'm well, not before them, in the middle of them, actually. I was reviewing our websites just updating a couple of things. And I saw that elamhealth.org.au is a website, 
And on there is a, there's a link to this other website called vegetariancooking.com, something like that. And who knows what vegetariancooking.com is? That's your website! <laughs> That's Victoria's website for their cooking demonstrations that they did in 2017. And it has some fantastic pictures and wonderful recipes. I've been thinking, oh, this is brilliant. If we could just get all our Elam Health recipes that we do in Schofields, get the photos, because we've got all the photos, we'll put the recipes up on that site and just add to it. That'd be fantastic. You know, and then just because people are ringing us up. In fact, people are commenting on the YouTube channel. Can you please, uh, how do we get the recipes? Because people don't come, they watch. In fact, after that first one, within a, a couple of days, we had 100 views. Within, a, in, uh, we, um, within one day, sorry, we had 100 views. Within two days, we had 200 views. And so we're getting hundreds of views on those channels. People are open to the health message. And remember, Jesus healed, spent more time healing than he did preaching, helping the people reaching them with their physical needs in the, way that, in, in, in the hope that the door might be open to their heart. And so God's given us the right arm of that message, the, help, the third angel's message, to open the doors to people's homes and hearts that we might then present the gospel message to them. Who wants to be a part of this movement? Yeah, don't we all want to be? Praise God. May the Lord bless you and help us to be inspired and let our movement be just that a movement to share this everlasting gospel to the world around us in hastening the coming of Jesus. Amen.